With that, let's uh, start with, uh, we have Jason up here on what is Forge and why should you care? Jason? All right, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. We're talking about Forge. My name is Jason Kunkel. I'm a senior practice manager at CAD Microsystems, so I do consulting around um, Revit, around BIM. We do training standards. I do a little coding on the side, and honestly, it's not really coding as much as it's copying and pasting other people's code and then beating up until it works. So I imagine some of you are kind of on the same page with that as well. Uh, I'm going to give a disclaimer at the beginning of our presentation tonight. Um, I try to use this slide as often as I can, but we are dialing the nerd level up to 11 for this presentation. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, you all chose to come to a software user group tonight. So this is partially on you. So just keep that as mind as we're going through some of this. <clears throat> Real quick, as an outline, we're going to talk about APIs, kind of what they are at 30,000 feet, so we have a baseline uh, of what we're talking about. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Revit API, how it applies, what you can do with it, and then I want to dive into Forge. I want to break down um, what it is, the different components, and then I want to talk just a little bit about what you can do with it or what you potentially will be able to do with it down the road. Uh, a lot of this conversation is planting a seed. So like Jeff mentioned, this is the way Autodesk is going. So if you've used BIM 360, if you've used anything on BIM 360, that is all built on Forge. And everything's going to the quote cloud, uh, everything's going to be, you know, up in the internet and um, what they are building and what they are setting up for Forge is, is how we are going to offer certain services and hopefully make our, our lives a little easier down the road. So from 30,000 feet, APIs, what is an API? API stands for Application Programming Interface. Uh, it is the tools and functions kind of behind the scenes that you can access software and get software to do what you want it to do. Um, it can be the middleman between two pieces of software as well. So when you're using Word, when you're using Revit directly with your mouse, you're going through the user interface. You're going through the UI. The API is essentially a back door into the software that lets other programmers use it. Not with mouse clicks, not on the monitor, but through calls, through rules, through methods that are exposed through the API. So if we're talking about the Revit API, it is made specifically for Revit. Um, <clears throat> it has not been around forever. I, I can't remember exactly what release it was, but when I started using Revit on version 2008, or it wasn't even 2008, version 8 or version 9, back then there was like, we're never going to have an API, it's never going to be opened up, and then a couple of years later there was an API. Um, so that allows people to build software that hooks into Revit, and there's a good chance you've used it. Uh, one of the nice things is any new feature that rolls out with Revit is typically inside the API. So I'm trying to think what were some new features. You know, the new 3D views. Um, I'm blanking on all my new features. A lot of MEP new stuff that came out recently. That's all in the API. It can all be accessed and tweaked uh, programmatically. Some of the older features, for some reason, have not been rolled into it. So one of the things that, that is really odd, for some reason, we cannot use the API to create ceilings. Floors are fine, walls are fine, roofs are fine, ceilings are not. We don't know why. It's not there. Hopefully someday it'll be in the API and we can programmatically uh, create some ceilings. Um, and obviously it's made for Revit. Now, <clears throat> what it does is it allows programmers to update Revit information inside of your model without using the user interface. The key here, you, you have to have Revit running to run a third-party application inside of Revit. So I can't write a program that accesses the Revit API outside of Revit. So what that also means is I have to own Revit. I have to buy a license of Revit for it to do things with my third-party program. There are tons of examples out there. We talk about Dynamo a lot here. Dynamo is kind of just a visual programming skin of the API that sits inside of Revit. So Dynamo can only do things that the API can do. So tomorrow, go see if you can add a ceiling through Dynamo. You're not going to be able to. Um, <clears throat> Autodesk itself, if there's functionality they want to use to enhance the software, they will often write an application through the API as opposed to putting it right into Revit on its own. Roombook is an example. The model checker, the Kobe extension, uh, WorkShare Monitor technically is, a, is an add-in that accesses through the API as well. 
It's not in the core software. It is another piece of software that's built on top of there. Uh, here at CAD Microsystems, we build our own stuff. We got Filter Plus. Just a little plug there for you. If you're not using Filter Plus, you're wasting your time. Um, Keynote Manager, I know a lot of folks use Keynote Manager. Uh, and if you're curious about kind of keeping up with it, there is a blog, revitaddons.blogspot.com. Just every week, I mean, there's like a dozen new Revit plugins every week that come out. Some do one tiny thing, some do 10,000 giant things. It just depends on the process that they need. Uh, but these were all developed by programmers through the Revit API. So in a nutshell, APIs let programmers work with other pieces of software. Revit has its own API. And then the Revit add-ins done through the API must run through Revit. So I'm building tools to make my life easier, but I've got to use Revit to run those tools. That's where Forge kind of comes in. So Forge itself, um, it is a series of web-based APIs. It's developed by Autodesk. So it is targeting their markets. It's targeting their files. It's targeting their workflows, and it's going to support their customers. Um, it is not reliant on BIM 360, but BIM 360, the current generation of BIM 360, relies on Forge. So I'm not going to get back into classic and all that kind of stuff, but any new thing that comes out on BIM 360 was written on top of Forge itself. So they're using their own APIs. They're eating their own dog food to make their own tools. These are the different components. So these are a series of nine different APIs. There's a little bit of overlap about what each does. I'm going to quickly touch on each one, and then we're going to spend a lot of time on, does the spotlight work? All right, spotlight doesn't work. Uh, design automation. So design automation is the fun one. That's the one that's kind of most directly applicable to a Revit uh, user group. Uh, the first one they've got is a token flex API. It's about enterprise, enterprise cloud credits. Does anybody have enterprise licensing? It's really boring, so we don't talk about it too much. Um, reality capture API. So if you're using Recap, you can write your own software that essentially does what Recap does. Autodesk has a SPOSE functionality that allows you to do that heavy lifting, that heavy processing of generating 3D models from 2D images uh, through the Reality Capture API. There's a data management API, which is essentially just if you've got projects inside of BIM 360 and you need to rename folders, you need to move files around, that's what the file management API does. So essentially, if I've got a lot of projects inside of my BIM 360 projects and I hate the BIM 360 interface, I can write my own interface to move those files around. Uh, another example of this is we've seen um, instances folks will have a connector between their BIM 360 and Dropbox. So they want all their BIM 360 files copied over to Dropbox. They have used the file management API to grab all those files, copy them over. <clears throat> Authentication, it's important, but it's boring. Um, it lets you log in. It tells you, you this person, you're allowed to access these files. This is important. Um, this is critical. Model derivative has a really cool name, but it's not very exciting, frankly. Um, this will convert some files to a couple other formats. So who's, uh, who has projects up on BIM 360? Who's access projects and files? And you know when you click on the model and you get that interface in there, you get the right there? That is not the native Revit file. That is not the native STL. That has been translated with the model derivative app API to an SVS file, SVF file format. So that viewer is its own format, and model derivative is what takes your original file and puts it in that format. Now with that, I can write my own software that does it then. If I don't want to use their viewer, if I want to get an OBJ file, if I want to get an STL file out there, if I want to make some streamlined application that's going to take every single model, it's going to give me something I can 3D print, I can make a program that's going to utilize the model derivative, kind of the model transformation, and it'll spit out a file that allows me to do that. So we're rushing through some of the boring ones. Webhooks, Webhooks is actually kind of cool. It's kind of a, a more recent one. Um, Folks have used if, this, then, that before. You know the concept about it. Something happens somewhere on the internet that triggers something else to happen. So the Webhooks API allows you to set up and register uh, triggers in your BIM 360 files, in your projects. So if somebody uploads a file, if somebody syncs with Central successfully, or you know, cloud syncs with Central, if somebody deletes a file, you can use a Webhook 
to trigger an activity for something else to happen. So the example I always give is every time you sync, you could automatically send out a tweet that you synced your model. Don't know why you'd want to do that. Obviously, you'd probably want to web hook into something that's more internal and kicks off maybe some accounting process or something on your project management software. Uh, but the web hooks allows you to register and subscribe to activities that are happening inside of BIM 360 so you can trigger new things that, that happen from that. So kind of basic, but, but you can do some really exciting stuff with it. There's kind of the overall BIM 360 API, and that includes things like creating accounts and setting up people as um, you know, admins on projects or their use on projects, lets you create projects, move files around. Uh, anything you can kind of do in BIM 360, the BIM 360 API kind of groups it up. Some of the nicer ones are the more recent ad additions to uh, BIM 360, your issues, um, your RFIs, and your checklist. So again, if I have these, if I need to edit them in bulk, if I need to download a bunch of them, if I need to check them all off at once, I can build my own application that will access all the RFI or all the checklist data on my BIM 360 project and do it through my tool as opposed to through, as opposed through the BIM 360 interface. So these are all hooks. These are all ways that we get in there, um, ways you can build your own tools on top of it. Uh, this is the viewer. This is what you people usually see when we talk about BIM 360. Uh, I don't have to use the BIM 360 website, and I don't have to use BIM 360 storage to use a large model viewer. I can build my own application. I can save my files somewhere else. Uh, it's, it's a nice, fast interface, and they've figured out all the bugs. Uh, and you can do some tweaks to the UI and some customization on there as well. So a lot of the BIM 360 stuff you see, you've seen up here. The API essentially means I can take parts of it and I can tweak it and I can make it work better for me. <clears throat> what I really want to talk about tonight is design automation. Um, back in, I want to say it was February, uh, I can't remember when, uh, I went up to Autodesk headquarters uh, up in Boston and uh, I was able to spend a week at what I'm going to affectionately refer to as Nerd Camp. And it was essentially a week where a bunch of programmers and developers get together and we got to work with the design automation team and we started hammering out new ideas for the design automation for Revit. We got to work on little ideas um, and this is where a lot of this stuff comes from. So there is design automation for AutoCAD, there's design automation for Max, there's design automation for Inventor. I forgot all those softwares a long time ago so I just worked on Revit um, and Revit is the one that's most recent as well. You'll notice it's in beta, um, but the, the, the potential hopefully is here. So kind of as a baseline for design automation, you can build an application that is Windows or desktop based or it's web based. Now with that, your application and the files in the application have to be internet accessible. So I can't just have you know, a completely off the web uh, file. The design automation API calls from the web. It has to be able to see the web. I have to be able to upload my files to the web. What it essentially is, is a headless version of Revit. So it is a UI-less version of Revit sitting in the cloud that can grab files and I can make it do stuff. <clears throat> if you have a Revit application, if you have a third-party application that we've been talking about, that I talked about earlier, those are kind of the first things that people are migrating over into Forge. There's no UI, so you have to build this kind of a web-based UI. Um, but this is kind of the first step that people are going for. It's like, I've got this thing, it's running on my desktop, I want to run it in the cloud. This is what we are going to be doing with that. Um, and as I said, the UI is kind of through your application, either through your website or through the program you design itself. From a conceptual end, so we're going to offset some of our processor heavy tasks. Um, if the Revit API could do it, you can pretty much do it in design automation as well. Here's kind of the key. You don't need to own Revit to run this. You kind of need to own Revit to write the software so you know how Revit works obviously, but you can build an application on the web through the design automation API it's going to allow anybody, anywhere, to manipulate Revit files through your application without using Revit at all. 
Um, you absolutely need a Revit model. But what this starts to allow for, something that started flickering in my head, is it allows collaboration between team members without needing the design software. In my past life, uh, at a very specific firm, in fact, did a lot of work around attention. Did a lot of attention work. We had a guy who was just creepily knew how criminals thought. Um, and he was just great at, you know, keying up doors and figuring out what should plug into this and where should go here. Um, I never wanted him in Revit ever, but he had a lot of information in his mind that we had to get into the model. So door schedules that were literally pages and pages long, we'd usually print out, he'd look at, he'd mark up, and we'd spit it back into Revit manually. This was one of the first things I thought about, and I think probably three or four people know exactly what I'm talking about, but um, design automation would have been an outstanding way for me to build an interface for him that simply exposes the door keying information, you know, only the parameters and only the data in the doors in my model that he needs to see through a web page. He just fills it out and it's done. It immediately injects that information into the model. So we're talking finishes, we're talking, you know, uh, schedules, room information, anything that somebody else on the design team needs to plug into. <laughs> you don't want to touch your model directly. You can quarantine pockets of that model to give to them through design automation. So that, that got me very, very excited. <clears throat> Some examples we had from NerdCamp. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to give names because I don't know how proprietary, but I'm going to tell you sort of what they did. Um, so first one there was, this was a pretty neat one. Um, th these guys, um, they, they had the need to make sure families that were being used had the same parameters, the same shared parameters plugged in them all the time. And instead of sending the shared parameter file out and hoping your consultants then went and, yeah, I've got, I've added all that, we're good, they set up a website that already knew the shared parameters file, already knew the parameters it wanted. You would upload your RFA file to the website, it would think for a couple seconds, and then you download that RFA file already with the parameters attached, all ready to go at the type level, at the instance level, everything set up exactly like they needed it set up. Kind of taking a couple steps further, they were talking about batches. So you just upload a bunch of family files at once. And then not only that, they could give you a form where you start pre-populating some of the parameters because it could add the parameters and start filling them out as well. <clears throat> Another example that I thought was pretty cool, um, there was a, a uh, fellow from Ireland who was working on this. Um, he was a residential uh, contractor. They have, you know, kind of their uh, the base models, but there's always variations. You can get this porch, or you can get this bathroom, or you can add this, or you can add that. He had what he referred to as kind of his supermodel. So it was a Revit file with dozens and dozens of options and option sets in there, like everything in this one file. And so people would chip, would select what they wanted, and then he would have to go into Revit. This is my option primary, you know, accept primary, delete, primary, accept primary, delete. He was starting to build the interface where people would go and simply select the options they wanted on the website, and then design automation in the back end would know, okay, this is primary, collapse. This is primary, collapse. This is primary, collapse. Without actually having to open Revit at all, they were then given a customized, specific model selected from their own options. Uh, he had a long way to go, but he made a first couple of first really cool steps, and it was just really, really neat to see. <clears throat> um, this is what I was up there working on. Uh, our uh, CAD microsystems, we work with Autodesk directly on the Revit model checker. Um, so we were up there. We are currently working on trying to get the model checker online. So instead of having to open up Revit and to run a check, you can just open up a web page, point to your projects in BIM 360, point to your check, and then let it run for you. Uh, this would be able to expose things like scheduling, uh, automatic emailing of reports, just a lot of functionality that you can't get with Revit sitting on your desktop. Uh, there's one guy, uh, part of the team, he's been tweeting about this. I haven't seen much recently, but he found just some web tool that you just draw lines on. 
And so he took that and now he converts those lines over into walls in a model. And then he, there's this little picture of a couch you drag on to the picture. And then that couch is in your model as well. So literally a design layout application through a web interface that immediately creates a Revit file for you. So some pretty wacky stuff that's going on at that point. All right, so those are our examples, some things to watch out for. Um, it is definitely still in beta, so keep that in mind. They're going to tell you 100 times, don't use this on production, don't use this on production, don't use this on production. Um, I would probably back that up, but definitely start thinking about how you want to start using this on production. Uh, we found the documentation to be spotty. If you do a Google search for something, you may get answers that are two years old, and the Forge API has been changing and, and updating so quickly Version 1 is already outdated, and version 2 is what you got to make sure you are paying attention to. <clears throat> this is a big asterisk on the design automation. So currently, it cannot support getting a local copy of a work shared model. You basically have to make a detached copy every time, run your design automation functionality on it, and then basically take it and kind of do a new save as central. Uh, this is their number one priority. They know this is something they need, need to tackle. Uh, but right now, this is probably the number one reason not to take it into production. Because every time you do something to your file, it's a whole new central model. And then you just got to start thinking about how your world is going to change forever. Crazy future thoughts. Um, I don't work for Autodesk. I don't know what Autodesk is thinking. This is just what was going on in my head as I was kind of working on this and playing with this. and. You know, just nutty, nutty, nutty things. This is starting to take Revit out of the Revit file. You know, this is starting um, to show us a new way that data in our models is going to be organized and thought about. It's not going to be a single model database anymore. There are going to be portions of database floating around the web that all happen to talk to each other and that everybody can access the portions that they want to access. So I don't think design automation itself is going to be the final form, but I think the more we start using it and the more we start doing things with it, that is going to help dictate and narrate what the next phase is going to be like. I feel like I'm talking about Pokemon right now because um, they're all going to evolve and we're going, anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, your cloud-hosted Revel model ultimately does not be a single file. It's a database. It's going to be stored in tables. It's going to be more efficient. Uh, and then everybody's going to be able to grab it when they need to grab it. So. With that, that was your uh, warning there. Quick summary, is everyone still awake? Forge is your web-based API. Design automation for Revit is a portion of the Forged API. It's going to open up your Revit models to non-Revit users. Hopefully, you picked up something. Any quick questions? Otherwise, we can roll into the good presentation for the night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question was, if you are one of, if you got a web page and you want to manipulate a, a family file, um, does that family file have to live in BIM 360? It does not. You just, you, your, your model doesn't either. Um, you simply have to be able to put that in the web. Essentially, all this stuff runs in Amazon Web Services. So you've got to be able to get it through the web, through your, your dialog up there. So yeah, it does not have to be on BIM 360. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the other question was, is there any limits kept on how much processing you can borrow? So right now, um, how they're talking about charging is going to be per processor minute. You hit 15 minutes. It's like one cloud credit. Um, currently, they will stop you after an hour of processing. So if your application just happens to loop or something and it hits an hour, it will just kill it. Uh, but everything we've been running has been faster in the cloud than it is on our desktop. And that's, so the UI is gone, and it doesn't have to wait for you to click, and it's just kind of rock and roll. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank All you, right. Jason. Cool.